Okay, we are back after a week's, do I say missing or hiatus, however we want to put that, just in case if you're looking for, did I miss a video on the um, website? No, we missed last week, so it is Wednesday, June 14th, and we will be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 22, really starting at verse 15. But looking back just real quickly, we've come through Abraham's greatest test of his faith yet to give up his son, his only son, his beloved son, to give him up knowing all the promises, everything that was to come hinged on this one son. Without him, Abraham's faith was so great that he fully believed if God has me slay him, God will resurrect him because he told his servants, we will come back to you statement of faith beforehand and he is uh, exemplified by and for his faith in other places in scripture in the book of hebrews in our hall of faith and, and other times also so we're right there at the end of that where the ram replaced yitzhak because it was only a test god did not want human sacrifice he wanted abraham to see that he was holding nothing back from god that God literally had his whole heart because he was putting his whole heart on that altar. We saw Yitzhak with a beautiful picture of our Messiah who would be the sacrificed lamb of God who would give his life. It would not be held back. It would not be stopped at the last moment. He would follow through and be our substitute so that we never face that penalty of death, which is the consequences of our sin. So, um, the rejoicing must have been amazing on that mountaintop as father and son gave that ram in sacrifice and praised God for what he had brought them through. <clears throat> now, we don't read of Abraham ever building another altar to the Lord. We've seen several times when he has, but really this is the ultimate altar. This is the altar, altar where the final sacrifice for sin has been depicted now. So we don't need to make another altar. The cross is the altar. It's the ultimate. It's where the blood is that, that procures salvation for us. Nothing more, nothing added to it. The picture is complete and full. It is his substitution for us. He died in our stead. He died in our place. So it's also interesting that it says here in verse 14, Abraham named the, the place the Lord will provide. As it said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And that provision that is Jehovah Yira, the Lord, our provider, that's reminding us in this chapter when we looked at the Hebrew earlier, it's God himself will provide and God will provide himself. What will he provide himself? God gives us God when that's what we need. And at the same time, it's God who does all the providing. It's like a double play on the words. We see more depth in our Hebrew from that. And we just stand in awe at what that really is saying. At the same time, the Hebrew also is giving us the idea that the Lord sees. He sees our need, provides for our need, takes care of our need, and he will see too our need. All of that you can glean from the Hebrew. So just far more in, in, especially when we look at the name Yehovah Yira, and uh, I believe this is our first time that we're introduced to that name, to the Lord provides all of that we see. So in God's relationship to man, to redeem man, wow, we lack nothing in his redemption. We have everything that we need. It's only by passing through trials that we learn what it really means to have Yehovah Yira. And it's only, the provision is only based on the sacrifice of his son, because that's where it all starts and ends. Nothing else matters except the, the salvation of our soul. The rest of this is just experiences that we deal with, that if we did not have salvation, we've lost it all. The thought that if you gain the whole world, but lose your own soul. There's just no way, no other way to compare. No other way to compare. It, it, that's all that matters is that he has saved us. And then everything else is blessing on blessing on blessing. And we can live the abundant life now as well as forever because of his grace. When um, Abraham said here to this day, and I'm looking for it, there it is. As it said to this day, 
actually, I shouldn't say Abraham said that because really the way that it is written, we know that's Moses. No, Moshe's no. Remember, he's the one recording. He's had, we believe, tablets given to him to help him in it, but he's the ultimate putting it all together. And it's his signature that will go on it because we're told that he wrote our first five books. But we know he wasn't alive in Adam's day. So it was either passed down to him through God's alone or God inspiring as these writings were given and passed down to man. Because we find that written language was there long before the evolutionary world gives it credit for. We see it way back in time. So it is not, it, there's no reason to believe that Adam could not write. There's no reason to believe that there was not a, a language. The idea that uh, Cadian developed and, and language developed and so forth is what I'm coming against. Moshe, Moses is the seventh generation from Abraham. That means you've got Abraham and you count down seven generations before you get to um, Moses, to Moshe. He's the fourth generation from Levi, Levi. Uh, we learn that in Genesis 15, 16. So third from Abraham, you have Isaac, Jacob, Levi. And then you go four more generations to get down to Moshe. So that means when Moshe put this note in that it's still to this day called this, it's been called that for over 600 years, approximately 630 years, that after this happened, Abraham of Yitzhak is still being called the mountain of the Lord will provide, Jehovah Yerub, the name of the place, on this mountain. And I don't think it's any coincidence that when we learn of the millennial temple, where they will go up all nations together to worship the Lord, they go up to the mountain of the Lord. I believe they're going up to Mount Moriah, either where Golgotha was or where Abraham offered up Yitzhak. We saw that it's the same mountain range and they're not far apart. So whichever way, maybe it's going to be that big because we're going to have so many coming up in the millennium. We've got a huge temple and maybe it's just counted on the journey to be part of it. I don't know. We'll find out. But uh, Yitzhak, Isaac was 30 here in chapter 22. 30 years later, when he's 60, he's going to have Yaakov, Jacob. We'll learn that when we get to chapter 25 and verse 26. Now, Jacob has Joseph when he's 91. That's 121 years from now. We tend to think of people in our lifespan. So we tend to think of 20 and 30 year olds having babies, and we tend to think of people, you know, uh, older and not living much longer at 90. But we've still got a little longer life going here. Yosef will live to 110. It's going to be 231 years after chapter 22, after the offering, when Yosef finally leaves our picture. So 231 years from Abraham's offering of Isaac to Yosef's death in Egypt. That's Joseph, okay? 231 years. Now, add 400 years down in Egypt, you've got 631 years right there when Moshe delivers them from Egypt. And he didn't write this the day that, he, that they came out of Egypt. He wrote it during the wilderness wanderings. So somewhere shortly after 631 years, he's writing it. But that's a long time. This place has been called by the same name for over 600 years. Just want you to see how it continues. God put it in motion and it's continuing. When David, David does buy the place for the Lord's house to be built, it's probably why it was phrased in that way, why he even wanted to choose Moriah, because that is the area that he chooses. He chose where he wanted to, to build that temple. Let's look real quick at First Chronicles chapter 21, and we'll look at starting with verse 18. First Chronicles 21 and verse 18 and following. First Chronicles 21, starting with verse 18. We'll see how far we read on your own read through verse 27. I'm just not sure I'll read that far today. I may have to because we're in for a story. <laughs> okay, verse 18 says, Then the angel of the Lord, remember we studied the angel of Adonai, Malach Adonai. We saw that that's, that's 
the Lord he himself in what we would call Christophany in form before he took on that human form. Uh, we can also see the angel of the Lord refers to Jehovah, the father, but one and the same. The angel of the Lord commanded God, that's Yad for you in the English. And that's not, when I say God in Hebrew, that's not G-O-D, that's G-A-D uh, here. To say to David, David that we should, that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornon, the Yadusite. So David went up at the word of, of God, which he spoke in the name of the Lord. Now Ornon turned back and saw the angel and four sons were with him. It goes on, they're, they're threshing. I think I will let you read it on your own. I'm jumping down for sake of time. Uh, we'll go down to verse 26. Ornan it talks about, I'll uh, give it to you. And David says, no, I'm going to buy it from you. I won't give anything to my Lord that didn't cost me. You know, that would be your gift to the Lord. Uh -uh, this is from me. I want to buy it. I want to gift it to my Lord. And they, they agree on an amount in verse 25 and verse 26 there. Then David built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And he called to the Lord and he answered him with fire from heaven on the altar burnt offering. Fire came out of heaven. We read about that with Eliyahu. Here we see with David, God brought fire out of heaven to consume his sacrifices. God was well pleased. And the Lord commanded the angel, uh, oh, that was the angel that was coming again. So I, I won't explain verse 27 right now, but you see David built the altar there. He he built the he bought this place, sorry, to build a place to worship the Lord, and it is where the temple is built. So um, again, probably his choice of place because he knew from his history what that place meant. That this was the place that his forefather Abraham had been willing to offer up Yitzhak, and so in that same place that that there was an altar there where father and son worshipped God. And, and foreshadowed the picture of Yeshua, David is stepping into that and wanting to make a formal place of worship for the Lord in that location. When we look back in Genesis 22 at that phrase, um, it will be provided. Uh, I got to get back to verse. There we go. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. This phrase here at the end now, that's a future tense in our Hebrew. That means that on the mountain of the Lord, he is going to provide. It's not just that he has provided, which we saw with the ram for Yitzhak and, and Abraham. But again, it is giving us that clear picture. This is looking forward. The Lord will provide on this very mountain because on this mountain, he's going to provide the, the sacrifice lamb of God, Seha Elohim, who's going to shed his blood for salvation, for all mankind, for redemption forever. So it can't be more clear, in my opinion. He sees, he sees to it, he provides, he has them, he will do. For us, we're looking back now, it is provided. It just all comes together. And it's the same Hebrew word um, for this place, all the way through it for the, the provision, everything that I'm saying, every time we see the word provision there, it's that's the same word. The tense is telling us now this was looking forward. So, and remember, it's being written also 600 years later. So, again, they saw a bigger picture of something even bigger coming for them. We know it today. It's Yeshua that was sacrificed on Mount Moriah, Golgotha in particular, for our sins, for our salvation. Um, I think I said it all, just looking to make sure. Yes, yeah, and it also can be said in the Hebrew understanding of those words on the mountain where Jehovah appears, and how did he appear in the form of the sun? So all of that's there. Did you have a comment, question? Is that word the monster? Now? Is that what you call it? The the. It's Moriah. It's Golgotha. Oh no no. Golgotha is one mind. part of Moriah. My brain. Soft and okay, you can catch the fly ball. <laughs> Yitzhak, Isaac's life is a picture of Yeshua. We see that through scripture. In this chapter alone, we're going to see that both, and I'll say it in English, Isaac and Yeshua Jesus, 
both were left by their father. Both offered themselves willingly. Both carried wood up the hill of their sacrifice. Yitzhak taking four. He's looking for the sacrifice. Yeshua carrying part of the cross. Both were sacrificed on the same hill. We've talked about that. And both were delivered from death on the third day. Remember, they went up and it was the third day for Yitzhak and Abraham even. And we know third day resurrection for Yeshua as was prophesied in scripture. That's just this one chapter long. Follow Yitzhak's life. It's amazing. Um, but we'll stay right now in context and we'll look at verse 15. Verses 15 and 18 are going to show us the reward for obedience. Abraham was 100% completely obedient. God sees it. God blesses him for it. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven. Remember the first time it's when he called out to stop Abraham from slaying his son when the knife was raised. Okay, so this time he calls out. And before I get us into verse 16 and say what he says, let me tell you what he's going to say. This is the covenant that God has made with it, Abraham. He's going to confirm it again and really show the enlargement of it right here, which is significant because remember the covenant had to come through Yitzhak. So the test has been there. Abraham has passed this test. God's reaffirming the covenant and showing how great a covenant it is that's going to come through uh, Yitzhak. So he says in verse 16, by myself, God speaking, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord. And remember, it's either Yehovah, Father, or Yeshua, the Son. They both carry the title of Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord. Uh, so whichever way, the, by myself, I, Yehovah, the Father, declares the Lord, Yeshua, Jesus. You can put it that way and be safe. Because you've done this thing. You've not withheld your son, your only son. Verse 17, indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand, which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Let me back up and unpack in this what we are seeing. Okay, all of a sudden I thought I hadn't given you angel of the Lord, but I did that a couple of weeks back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure I didn't mistakenly think. Okay, he's swearing by himself. We see that another time in scripture, let's pop over there real fast. It's Hebrews 6 and verse 13 and the following verses there. We'll start with it and whoops. And again, you can read it on your own. And if I get my fat fingers out of the way, okay. <laughs> Sorry. At least the tablet keeps the pages quieter. <laughs> Hebrews 6 and verse 13. We are going to read. For when God made the promise to Abraham, so we know we're talking same character, same promise, same time, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So when we read here, by myself, I have sworn, Hebrews is telling us why. He, there was no one greater. And he swore, surely I will bless you and I will surely multiply you. And it goes on, talks about how he had to wait for the promise. But the promise did come. He did obtain it. And of course, it, 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 um, it goes on. It's, well, you can read it. It's immutable. It's unchangeable. You know, it didn't just end with Abraham and Yitzhak. It's through Yitzhak that the rest of the world's going to be blessed because it's through the seed, which we know is a reference to Yeshua Jesus. But who could God swear by? We say in court, putting our hand on the Bible, that we swear on the word of God. What could he swear by? There's nothing greater. There's no one else beside himself, equal to himself. So he swore by himself. Uh, in the easiest, not easy, because there's nothing easy about understanding it, but the clear, the, the, the best I can do without fumbling any more than I already am <laughs> is you could say the, the father and the son looked at each other and swore by each other. <laughs> You can choose whichever way you want to say it, but one saying it and the other's confirming, however you want to put it. It's only by God, he himself, sewn up in the triunity of who he is, that this is being said. And it, it's to emphasize that this is the strongest possible. Um, you know, if you're telling somebody, you're trying to assure them, I promise, I really promise, I swear to you, I'll do it. You're trying to show them your intensity of meaning and that you're not going to let anything derail you that's in essence what god is doing here he's making sure abraham knows nothing's going to derail i am faithful 
I'm going to reward your obedience and I'm confirming that what I began, I complete. This is our faithful God. This is amazing. It is interesting that in scripture, it's the last time we hear that God spoke to Abraham. That what closing words. You know, I've talked to you before about last words. Wow, the last words were showing and explaining to Abraham how great this promise is. And, uh, um, okay, I, I've said it. Uh, because Abraham didn't withhold his son, Abraham was willing to be reduced to God only. Not God and his son, but God only. He wasn't depending on Yitzhak to fulfill the promise. He was showing he was depending solely on God. Because of that, God is rewarding him and saying to him, I will confirm my covenant to you. I will bless you with the stars. How does it say it? Let's go back to Genesis. Um, the stars, your seed will be as the stars of the heavens and the sand. Okay, the stars of the heaven, when they're compared to the sands of the seashore, we're talking spiritual when we talk about the stars in heaven. We're talking about um, physical when we're talking about the sand on the seashore. Where are you? Yeah. I'm sorry, I went back to Genesis. I know. Sorry, well, where Verse 17. Oh, verse 17. Indeed, I will break. Yes, 22 17. Okay. In, indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens. That's his spiritual seed. You're going to have 17, yeah. 22 17. It has nothing about stars in my, my thing. Read me your verse. Oh, sorry. Did you happen to be in chapter <laughs> in another chapter okay <laughs> that's okay we want to be on the same page we want to understand the spirit the ultimate spiritual seed is yeshua but we know that we also use that word that when we're in 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 yeshua we're his seed you know we're the offspring we use it both ways so ultimately of course yeshua but it's saying that there will be those of the faith who will follow who will be innumerable thank you god we're some of those in the physical that God would make him a great nation and we see the blessing that there's even a Jew today who comes from the line of Abraham. Abraham was not Jewish but he leads to the Jewish line that leads to the Messiah. We're seeing the physical blessing and it's interesting. Um, I don't know how they calculated it but one of these um, scientific brains um, who is a Christian <laughs> he took and he calculated again. I have no idea how he did it. Morris is his name. If you want to know the, the scientists I'm referring to, he said the number of the stars and the grains of the sand are the same. That there's as much as many stars as there is grains of sand, vice versa. Again, how does he know this? But the interesting part is he said then the number is 10 to the 25th power. That's the number 10 with 25 zeros after it. Might as well call it infinity. Yeah, that, that's an unbelievable number. That's how I figured it. Yeah, we figure it to infinity. Um, and just basically what I'm trying to show you is Abraham's obedience was based on his trust in God's promise. God promised descendants through Yitzhak. God promised the seed, Yeshua, through Yitzhak. And because Yitzhak was... Abraham's ultimate test, now that he's passed that test, that got that behind them, God's reemphasizing after Abraham's obedience. So it's not, you know, he's just showing Abraham, you trusted and what you trusted, you were right to trust him because I am faithful and I am going to do all that I promise. It's not off the table. It's not, oh, I just wanted to see what you would say or do. No, <laughs> God's saying, I, I will. And we see he has because we're on the other side of that. When it goes on to the degree to say that you, your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies, the gate was the courthouse, remember, in Bible times. So we saw that with the book of Ruth. We saw that with Yeshua. I showed you the gate before where it's not you open the gate, walk through. You know, it's an area where people could come together and had uh, stones where they sat. They sat in judgment. People brought whatever they needed to regarding the city or coming into the city to do business. It was done right there with the men 
who have that position. So if you have the gate, if you possess the gate of your enemy, you're ruling over your enemy. They're subdued to you. You are the authoritative power, and that's what's being said. And we'll see that when Yahshua, Joshua, the battle of Jericho, the walls fall down, they went in and they captured. And they did it how? By their might? No, they did it by God. Remember, all they did was march around, and then they made a whole lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> and down went the walls and they didn't fall out and kill the Israelis they fell in and floated on the enemy and they took the city without shooting a gun there were no guns but you get my idea <laughs> so okay so Avram's getting a great reassurance of a great blessing more than his mind could ever comprehend moving on in verse 18 because it's not over and in you your seed, I'm sorry, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Okay, in your seed. Here is where it's specifically, how are all the nations going to be blessed? Not because of Yitzhak, because of the seed that will come through Yitzhak. This is the seed that we know is Yeshua. This is Galatians 3, and we'll look at verse 14 and 16. Galatians 3 verses 14 and 16 where we read in order that in yeshua i'm sorry in mashiach yeshua in christ jesus the blessing of abraham might come to the gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the spirit through faith we know it came to the jews here in galatians is being introduced to the people living in galatia that this is for the gentiles also and verse 16 makes it very clear. It's coming through Abraham. But verse 16 says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say to his seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed. And now if you've got any doubt, here it is in black and white. That is Messiah. That is Christ. So how is the Jewish world blessed? How is the Gentile world blessed? One and the same through the seed called Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. That's what's being referred to. The whole nation would be blessed, and in time, the nations of the world would be blessed, especially when they're going up to worship the Lord together during millennial reign. It'll be a beautiful sight to see the nations not coming against Israel, but coming up into Israel to go worship the Lord together. Wow, that I can't wait to see that. I mean, that's just mind-blowing for what we see today i think we Is are during ready. the thousand years during the thousand years during the time when the, the millennial temple is huge read ezekiel 40 to 48 get the size and and it says that the glory of the lord filled the whole temple this is when he's come through the eastern gate and he has filled his temple with his presence they'll go up and they'll worship together um, they'll go up for the feast days, even though the Gentile nations will come up, they'll bring their fruits to the Lord, they'll be blessed. It says if they don't come up, then their nation won't receive rain. If you don't receive rain, you're not going to have crops to bring in another time, you're going to have famine. But God promises you come up and worship me, bring to me, and I'll bless your land during that time. But that's when they'll say, come, okay, let's go up to the mountain. Is this going to be like the representative go over there and represent us? I mean, because we can't all go. Well, we... We're not going to be here. Right. The we but the we who are here. Okay. <laughs> the we who are on the earth, living the earthly life of that. Um, if it's the same way it was during Bible times, the males were to go up. All male Jews were to go up. No matter where they lived, they were to go up to Yerushalayim three times a year. So if it follows that same pattern, then I'll say, yes, there's representatives that go. But... I don't know because I don't know everything about the millennium exactly how it will be. Does it need to be larger than the area now? Excuse me, to even facilitate just the males? Yes, it needed to be huge. I can't imagine. I do realize that there's a way in through the, the steps that they usually went up. There would be a way out on the other end so you can keep it moving. Kind of like if you've ever seen a hot luck and everybody comes to the middle you're in trouble but if you keep the line moving <laughs> it's this our human that's trying to figure it out Rhonda can you unmute yourself 
and I'm going to try. So I'm stepping out of the picture, but I'm not walking away. But I'm going to try to unmute you too. And Roger always gets in trouble. I'm sure he has a good reason for being gone, but the poor guy, as soon as he's gone, and I can't find, there we go. There we go. Okay. I have unmuted you on his end. Try, there we go, Rhonda. Go ahead. Okay. Um, why can't, let's see here. I can hear you now. Uh, why can't in um, Genesis 2218, why, why isn't that like in your seed? Why isn't that Isaac's seed and that Jesus is from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is true, that it is through that line. But when it's pulled out to be singular, when Galatians refers to it and says, we're not saying it in the plural, we're saying it in the singular, then what they're making very clear is Isaac isn't the savior, Yeshua, Jesus is the single seed that was being promised. But yes, it's always true. I mean, obviously he came through Isaac and Jacob and as the line went down so I, I see here the seed you know in Galatians the seed is capital S and oh, in, okay and in okay. Genesis it's lowercase as if to say in in Isaac's seed okay um uh, they're taking a little liberty capitalizing it in Galatians because they know it's referring to Yeshua so they did capitalize it. At least I don't think that's in the original um, capitalized, but that doesn't matter because they drew the right conclusion. Um, it's still, it's really not meant to be saying against Isaac because it, it was through Isaac that the seed came. It was, it's just to try to help us understand, don't just look to Isaac. You've got to look past to the seed that we're talking about. That's what it's trying to do. But yeah, but it really um, is all, it's all agreement. It's through that seed came the Messiah. So, um, you know, we wouldn't have had the Messiah if Isaac had died and had no offspring. We'd have no Messianic line that was promised to Abraham. Mm -hmm. There would be a, a break. So it has to be through Isaac also. But when it's referring to the seed that saves, the seed that will save, the seed that God is providing, he wants you to look past Isaac to his son. And the seed that is blessing is the seed. Yes, is the son. Yeah, Isaac doesn't have the ability to bless the world, bless the nations. No, it's the son of God, very God himself, who is able to. So does that clear it up? Yes, thank you. Okay. Sure, Dora. Okay, because mine says to the seed as referring to many, but rather to one. Right. When they get real specific, they want to make you sure you're realizing, you know, we, we said yes to the seed, and we know that the seed started with Yitzhak, but we want you to look all the way and realize we're talking about one. We're not talking about Yitzhak. We're talking about the Son of God. 16? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just getting real specific. You know, I, I can say that the Savior was going to come into the world and be human. We know he came through Isaac in his humanity, but don't stop there. It's not any of Isaac's doing. It's not Isaac's seeds. It's his seed. Because how many generations down the road is, is Christ come? From Isaac to, um, if I go to Matthew real quick to try to answer that, Matthew gives us three sets of 14 generations. 14 and the, the, Matthew. Yeah, Matthew 1. And I'm going there with you real quick. It's, it's a good question. How far from Isaac to Yeshua? And we know that when it draws these 14 generations, it doesn't mean that they're all the same. Like each generation is 20 years or 40 years, but they're all different years. And we know that there were others in between, but they drew like the main, the ones that had the most to do that, that made it stand out that, that they count from like, we count from Abraham, Yitzhak and Jacob. And we do know that was literally grandfather, father, grandson. But then we don't count every single name and every single, we sometimes skip a couple and get down to another that stood out like David stands out you know, something like that. So even with this, 
I can just tell you in the counting of the genealogy in, in Matthew 1, how many generations, but there were little subleps in there, I'll put it that way. Um, so if I look at that, we start right away. Isaac is the second out of the first 14. So it would be 12 more there, 14 times two is 28, 30, 39, 40 generations later, 42. 40 generations in, in approximation. You know, there's a little more than 40, but 40 that count. 40 that God said, mark this, mark this, mark this, mark this. There are, there are 40 generations that come down to Yeshua. Did you look it up? In? Well, I just multiplied 14 times 3. It came out 42. Because you, you counted Isaac himself and Abraham. And I started with Isaac's offspring. Okay. So, oh, same way. What, what? Same way. I yeah. started, if you want to start from when Abraham and Isaac are living, then yes, 42 generations. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but like I say, if someone got real technical, I've got, you know, is it here? No, then it's behind there. It's, it's that timeline that I've got that stands about this big and is longer than my dining room table. It could go around the room, you know, on the wall. In fact, somebody showed up with it down in my uh, Friday, where I meet on Fridays with people, and they had it without it being bound in a book. And she said, if I started in this room, it would go all around the room. I said, I know, I know what you're talking about. It, there's so much. And so in the Hebrew here, they took what, how people remember. The same way that the shepherds probably did in the field. They took what stood out and passed that down to their generation, passed that down. And then, you know, when you first have only a couple of generations, you can tell everything about it. It's like your history class. I'll tell you. When I had history in high school, you learned very well the history, the time period that your teacher was most interested in. <laughs> then you got all the rest of history crammed into whatever <laughs> talk you left. So, you know, when they started teaching history back in, let's say, 1000 AD, they didn't have as much to go through as 2300 <laughs> AD. It's the same way. There's so much more that they find ways to make it more concise and bring it down. But that gives you a pretty good plumb line because this is the one God chose to, to bring it in. And this is the one that's most important to show you the fulfillment of scripture. How can I say Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that their seed is Yeshua? Right here. This is all I'd have to take them to is this genealogical record here in Matthew 1 that starts with uh, it tells you it's the genealogy of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of David. Now, he wasn't David's son, but as a title he's given. It says he's the son of Abraham. Well, he wasn't Abraham's son. Yitzhak was. But we know that in essence, he was the son of Abraham because Yitzhak was a picture of him. And then it goes on and it tells you. So great Jewish genealogy great way to show our Jewish people and why I absolutely love and believe it's God ordained and God divine that Matthew, Matthew was put in the new covenant first because our Jewish people who are told don't don't deal with the Brachadah the new covenant yours is only the original what for for us for our all sake and purposes, Genesis to Malachi, it's not the way it is in the uh, in the Tanakh, but it's the same material, it's just a different order, but the same way, it stops. If we can get them to take a peek, and I encourage my Jewish brethren, you think that that New Covenant, that New Testament, you think that's supposed to be for the Christians. You say, nope, the Jewish people get the original, the Christians get the new, and you try to separate it, well, then what's my Jewish genealogy doing in the new? Why isn't it in the original? It is in the original, but I mean, why is it being, why is that how it starts? You know, when you start an article, when you start something that you're writing that's important, you want to start with a wake-up sentence. Here's what I'm going to prove. Boom, this is what's important. Then you reveal it, and then you get a strong conclusion. Well, look what the B'rach HaRashah starts with. The re recorded genealogy of Yeshua. For all my Jewish people are saying, well, we don't know who Messiah is. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you his genealogy. Let me tell you why he had to come before 70 AD, because the records are destroyed. 
Then no one can prove Messiah today. If someone shows up today and says, I'm the Messiah, I've got, I'm my genealogy, she goes all the way back to Avram Yisach and Yaakov, I'll say, ha, 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 prove it. They can't. They can't. If they can manage to get through the Holocaust, they cannot get through 70 AD. There's no records, no temple records. They were all burned. God saw to it. Those records were there when Yeshua came on to the human earth and were recorded. So we have a record that makes it past the burning, that makes it all the way into 2300 AD, that cannot be argued with. Because anywhere it does touch on anything secular, the secular proves it. So here we are, and we go into it, and I am sidetracked, so I'll do it in a nutshell. We see the Jewish genealogy. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It goes on with Judah. And then, you know, names that are just popping out. We see um, Boaz and Ruth, David, Solomon. These are all Jewish names. I could go back and I could read it to you with my Hebrew, and I could give it to you all in Hebrew. And every Jewish person's got to go, wait a minute. She's reading my genealogy. That's my line. What's it doing in that Christian book? <laughs> you think maybe it's Hebrew Christian that is Jewish Christian? You think maybe it's a continuation of the Jewish story, which is his story, his story, history of Yeshua? And look at a bit starting in the, the, this beginning here, this strong, where does it tie up? And it ties up with the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Boom! What an end. Matthew Revelation. Who, who could have figured that one out better? I know God did that. Man didn't do that. God did that. Yeah, I'm excited. And everything that was started in Bereshit Genesis, I can see completed in Revelation. It's like, I think it was Dr. McGee. I think it was. I want to give credit where it's due. He said, Genesis, Grand Central Station, all the trains are sent out. Revelation, Grand Central Station, all the trains come home. We <laughs> tie it up. The original has somewhat concealed. The new has it revealed. It's one story. It's one continuous. And it's for the Jew from Bereshit to Revelation. And it's for the Gentile from Genesis to the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Yes, one story, his glory. Okay. Oh, I like that. One story, his glory. Yay, I like that. I'm stealing that. So, <laughs> so why did they choose David to say it's David's son? Because of the scriptures promising, God promised to David his son. In the same way he promised to Abraham his son, and we know it foreshadowed Yeshua. In the same way he promised David, and it foreshadowed Yeshua. So it fits all the prophecies that God gave in the original. It's it's showing it in a um, on another level because God promised David one from him would sit on the throne forever. That would be the son of David. We know that's Messiah. God promised Abraham through Yitzhak Messiah would come. So it's just another huge landmark of prophecy fulfilled by the pictures that were drawn through these human characters. <laughs> I lost you. I can tell I lost you. <laughs> okay. Um, you have certain moments in your life history that stand out, okay? God chose to have Isaac stand out and be a great picture of Yeshua. God had David stand out and be a great picture of Yeshua. And God said to David, your son when through your son your son will sit on your throne forever well solomon didn't sit on his throne forever so it didn't mean solomon the same way abraham your son will be the sacrifice and isaac wasn't david's son wasn't so it's a picture of the son of david who will sit on the throne forever it's a picture of yeshua so it, it was um emphasize because God made special promises to David. God made special promises to Abraham. So it's fulfilling those promises. It's it's showing the picture. Again, it's when God started a picture here and then he shows it revealed here in greater detail 
than necessarily in everybody else's lives that are all part of the picture, but not the bigger, better, how can I say it? Uh, a more crystal clear, every detail picture. Okay? I got it. Any other questions? Is everybody okay? Are you following? <laughs> okay. I think we've got it. it. It's amazing. And it is. You're trying to digest the whole Bible in a few sentences. Mm. Full satiating, but I got to I gotta digest that one. <laughs> I got to work on that one for some time. You can chew on it for a while. How's that? <laughs> so, but what, what a picture we have here. And let me let me bring it home in this. So in verse 18, back in Bereshit in Genesis 22, we're seeing that that seed is being referred to as Messiah in Galatians 3. We saw that clearly. Now in verses 17 and 18, it says, indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply. Um, let me get what I want to stand out. I'm losing one of them. There it is. I found it. Okay. Let me read it to you this way, and I'll make the word stand out. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand, which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Did you catch three times your seed, your seed, your seed? Where are you reading? Verses 17 and 18, Genesis chapter 22. Oh, no, I Sorry. Sorry. We've got three times that the word is used, your seed, your seed, your seed. And the way it's written in the Hebrew gives the idea of that being the singular, referring to Yeshua. We're seeing that double meaning. Let me give you the second meaning, and I think you'll understand. It's very interesting that three times God refers to Yitzhak as Abraham's only son. In verse 2, verse 12, and verse 16 of this chapter. Okay, verse 2. We'll look real quick so I'm sure I don't lose you. Verse 2, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Yitzhak, okay? So he's called him your son, his only son. Verse 16, and said by myself, I've sworn, declares the Lord, because you've done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son. And then in verse, uh, that was, I skipped 12 in between, sorry. Verse 2, verse 12, verse 16, and verse 12 he said, do not reach out your hand against the boy. Do not, do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. So three times God emphasizes Isaac as your son, your son, your son, your only son, your only <clears throat> son, your only son. And three times he refers to the son, the seed, singular, in the seed you'll be blessed. So just again, to show us, yes, we see the other picture, but he's really holding in, uh, in particular and wanting us to see Yitzhak is a picture of Messiah. That's what we're to, to pull out of this. And it's just amazing how God wrote that into scripture. That kind of level doesn't just happen. That was God ordained because they haven't lived this out. They don't have Messiah as an example. They can't go back and look and like we can and say, oh, I see how Messiah's life parallel is prophetically being told. And then we do see it revealed. So we know God keeps his word. He fulfills every promise, every prophecy in such minute detail that it, it can't just happen. Is this because it came from how he had promised him, uh, Abraham, that from Sarah and him, not from anybody else, but the two of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And then through Isaac and on down. Yes, very specific. And remember, that's why it was even so critical that we know that Sarah was not touched by Abimelech, that we can't say, well, whose son is it really? <laughs> no, God let us know. Not only 
of that house, but all of them, it was shut off. There was no touching. And Abimelech even mm -hmm. said, I would have, but God came to me in a dream. You know, God told me, I'm a dead man. Get her out of here. You know. <laughs> so why did God tell so clearly? Because nobody can come up and say, oh, yeah, Isaac could have been, you know, yeah, no, especially since Abraham and Sarah had not had children. So God, God's in the detail. That's what I'm trying to say. He's in the detail, and it's amazing. And here in Genesis 22, back where we are, and I'm there. Okay, and I want to find it in verse 18. Oh, I'm in 12. Let me get down to 18. Now it looks right. Yes. Okay, we've read again, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then here in the reason, he says, because you have obeyed my voice. This is our first reference to obey in scripture. And what do we see from this? When we obey God, look at the results. Look at how rich Abraham's blessing was. Yes, that test was severe. Yes, the trial was hard. Yes, God grew Abraham up to be prepared for it. We saw that and talked about that before. But look at how blessed he was because of his obedience. Now, God would have kept his plan one way or another. That Abraham would not have the blessing. It, it just it couldn't happen any other way. God, God kept in control. But what I want you to see is when you're obedient to God, it may not be easy, but when you are obedient to God, the result will be rich blessings. I just guarantee it. First time we see it in scripture, every time we see it in scripture. And I think you all know, preaching to the choir, you know, obedience brings blessing. It's more important to God, he said, even than sacrifice later. He tells them, I'd rather have your obedience than your sacrifice. Why? Because they can just do a sacrifice for them and thinking about it just this is automatic, this is what we do, but their heart's not there. Abraham's heart was in this. His whole self was in this. Everything was in it. His whole future was on the line with it. He held nothing back. We need to put our whole heart into the Lord. We need to bank our future on the Lord. We need to not question his direction. If he says go, go. If he says no, no. <laughs> Whatever, you know, and, and great will be your reward. And I'll go so far as to say, not only here, but through all of eternity. How do I know that? Follow me home. You'll see. <laughs> These promise. Okay, so I think we're ready for verse 19. No questions, comments. We're good. Okay, then verse 19, we have, so Avraham returned to his young man, and they got up and went together to Beersheba, and Avraham lived in Beersheba. We have no mention of Isaac now. And again, the reason I think that we have no mention is because he's been a picture of Yeshua and Yeshua's sacrifice. What happened to Yeshua after he resurrected from the dead, after he was the sacrifice? And Doris pointing, he ascended. By us not hearing about Isaac in the rest of this picture, I think it's a picture of the Lord's ascending into heaven so that he wasn't seen in the picture. And it makes me wonder, it could be, this was again, the mountain area where the Lord ascended into heaven. We know it was at Beit Anya, and we know that can be part of the Mount Moriah mountain range. So I think it all fits, but whichever, I think it is to be a picture of his ascension into heaven, possibly from this mount. Okay, can't guarantee you exactly where Avram offered up Yitzhak. I can guarantee you where Bayonne is, where Golgotha is, it's all, you know, close enough related. Just, just an interesting point. But he went to Beersheba. Now, Mount Moriah, we know, is called the Mountain of the Lord. So he went from the Mountain of the Lord to Beersheba. And if you don't remember, Beersheba meant the well of the oak. Remember, it was seven wells. Seven we thought was complete and perfect. We see a lot to do with the well there. But what I see in this is that he went from the place of sacrifice, Mount Moriah, to the place of the oath, because God oath? promised. Oath. 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 Swear. Oath. I swear. Oath. O-A-T-H. Don't eat it. Put an H on the end of it. O-A-T-H. 
You can eat your oats, you can fill your oats, but oat is your words, <laughs> okay? So he went from the place of sacrifice to the place of the oath. God swore, God promised, God completes the picture. On the basis of Messiah's sacrifice, God will perform his oath to Abraham. First, by being the sacrifice, and then secondly, by blessing the nations through the sacrifice and really also through the nation of Israel, which Messiah comes through to, because we know Israel will in millennial time be that head nation that the rest of the world is blessed through when she's really doing her job of presenting God to the world like she was supposed to. She's supposed to be the kingdom of priests and she will be during the millennial reign. Okay, I thought we had a question. <laughs> okay, all right, are we ready to go verses 20 and on? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a rich lesson. I'm sorry it got separated in time. Go back and, and take it all together. It, it's wow, there's so much in this chapter. It's exciting. So verse 20, we're going to get the genealogy starting here, 20 to 24 to the end of the chapter. It's going to be the, the genealogy now of Abraham's brother of Nahor. And you might say, well, why is he in the picture? <laughs> A very good question to ask. I love it. Let me give you an answer. <laughs> because of who's going to come from Nahor. We're going to have a pivotal person come in his line. Anyone know the name? Okay, let me read you the genealogy and see if you pick it up. It came after these things that Abraham was told, saying, Behold, Milcah, also his born children, to your brother Nahor. So husband and wife are Nahor and Milcah. And I may not get all these names right in my pronunciation, but Uz, his firstborn, Uz, his brother, Kamuel, the father of Aram, Hesed, Kaza, Paldish, <coughs> Yalf, oops, Yedolf, sorry, sorry, Yedolf, I'll apologize to you one day, and Bethuel. <coughs> and it was Bethuel who fathered Samuel. Ah, here, and ah, we got it. In Hebrew, Rivka. In English, Rebecca. Rebecca is going to be key and important. Anyone know why? Because that's Isaac's wife. Very good. We go from Y to Wifey. <laughs> Yitzhak has now come through this time of testing because he was a willing recipient in that. We're going to see if he gets a reward too. He's going to get a bride. And we're going to come into that in chapter 24. So we need to know the history because it's going to be critically important that we know that Rika, Rebecca, is of the family. Nahor is who? Abraham's brother. Okay, that's very important. Can we call him Avi and, and, and Nahi <laughs> to help you? I don't know what to do to connect it, but I want it to be connected in your mind. <laughs> Abraham and Nahor are brothers. Out of them, we've got Isaac and we're going to have Rebecca. Okay, so we're going to, we'll study that more when we get to chapter 24. 23 is a little faster moving than 22 and 24. Um, but but it's here in preparation for it. So we've got to stress it. Now, it goes on and it tells us um, these eight, and if you count their days, that Milcha bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Three emphasis, just like I just did. His concubine, so back in the day when the, this was allowed, they had their wife, and then they had a concubine who did not have the wifely privileges, but had the the, the sexual was there. Birthing privilege. <laughs> the birthing privilege. Of the, <laughs> the slaves of, of the home sometimes this was how they could have families. Um, it, they, you know, they were they, they were given some privileges, but they were not equal to the wife. Okay. We don't see that as God's ordained way, but it was a way he permitted in, in you know for a while in the beginning. We'll see when we get down to Yaakov, Jacob, he's going to have two wives and two uh, slave girls, two concubines in essence, we've got four mamas. Absolutely blows me away. I laugh. DNA is, that's come so far to help you know your genealogical lines has come out with the statement, well, we know we can trace back the Jewish line to four mamas. 
And when they came out with that, I thought, are you willing to say it? I'll give you their names. <laughs> Rachel, Leah, Bilha, and Zilpah. They proved the word of God. Yes. Okay, so uh, where did Rachel come from? Was it the concubine or his wife? Wife, Jacob's wife. Well, that's the only one he wanted for a wife. Right, <laughs> right. He got Leah first by no, accident. No, no. Not, 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 not that one, but it says here, okay. It was oh. Abraham's brother. Yes. And, the, and oh. his concubine. Right. The concubine has these next names. The concubine's children were Ruma, Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Ma'aka. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those were from the concubine. The ones the eight prior listed were from his wife. Okay. From Milcha. Okay. So they're pure. It, it, they're not from Hagar. <laughs> they're from, you know, they, they, they're from. Um, Milcha and Nahor had the eight. Then Nahor and his concubine had these other five. So the Nahor is the father of 13 sons, bless his heart. Yeah, this will cut out for him. <laughs> but he had two mamas. Okay. And the one that's a wife and the one that was not. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So to, to add another layer onto it, if you don't get it, Abraham, because he's the father of Isaac, okay, so Abraham and Nahor are on this level, and then you've got Isaac, and I can go through this again with you too, but that will make Isaac's daughter, uh, I mean, Isaac, uh, forgive me, I'm going to get you confused. What I'm trying to say is Rebecca is Abraham's grandniece or great niece, whichever way you want to say it, because she's the daughter of his nephew. Nahor is his brother. Nahor's son is Abraham's nephew. Okay? I've lost you. It's so hard to, it's easier when you see it on paper. It, it really is. Take my word for it right now and I'll show you a chart. I've got a chart and I'm trying to find a way to reproduce it where we can see it on the screen and I can pass it out to you. And that will show you that Abraham and Nahor are brothers. So let's say, because you know my family, my brother, David, his children are my niece and nephew. Their children are my grandniece and nephew. In fact, I should have gone to the other side of the family because we're about to have another grandniece born there <laughs> any day. So I've got Ruth. She's my sister. Lindsay's her daughter. There's my niece. Capri already is my granddaughter. Grand, I'm sorry, my grandniece. Or her sibling will also be called my grandniece. That we don't have a name for yet. Okay. Does that help? Okay. Okay. Have I confused everybody today? <laughs> I feel like I've done a, done a great job. <laughs> uh, but we'll go back through it because we'll be studying the relations and why it matters. There are reasons why this matters. But anyway, we have the line. Not, we know Abraham has only had its off. I don't know how fast this all happened and when he knew that I can imagine if if Nehor was putting out one son after another son after another son while Abraham sitting here waiting at the gate, <laughs> that had to be hard. <laughs> but the promise was there and God brought the promise through and he got gold in one. He didn't need 13. <laughs> no, whose son was what? That was really it's more like Abraham's nephew. That it wouldn't okay. have been, it would not have okay. been Nahor because we have the, the genealogy of Nahor here. So it had been his other brother, and I don't remember the name, but Terah was, Ter was born three Abraham, Nahor, and the one I can't think right now. Okay. That would be the one who had Lot in his line. Yeah. And, and yet Abraham was, was taking care of him like a father, which we see happen today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the name will come back or I'll look it up for you. Uh, so we're told in verse 20 that um, Abraham was told. Remember, Abraham's left his family. He came out alone. It was just, oh, so Rhonda, I'll get your question in one second. Sorry. It was Abraham was to leave his family and he was to go alone. So he apparently got word of his brother, probably through the caravans, because there was traveling that took place. Remember, it wasn't strange that Abraham was able to travel. It was, he was to go to an unknown place. 
So probably the caravans that came through um, probably came with news. You know, they, oh, you came from you know, Mesopotamia. Do you know Abraham's family? Oh, yes, I know his, his brother Nahor. I know him well. Mazel tov. They had another son. <laughs> <laughs> the word was passed down where Abraham had family news, but he's separate from that. And probably it was passed back through the caravan that Abraham had a son when it had finally happened. So that's how we get it. Why it says it was told to Abraham because Abraham wasn't there living in the midst of it. It was told to them. They had the Pony Express in that day. No, that was Camel. Camel Express. I stand corrected. That was the Camel Express. <laughs> Rhonda, your question? Okay. Uh, this is a little off side the discussion, but it just came to me. When oh. when did um I know adultery was uh, the law under Moses, but were concubines approved by the wives? Was that like or was that sneaking around? What was that? <laughs> it was accepted. It was accepted in that time. That's why when Sarah told Abraham to take Hagar, that was not unusual. It was wrong because God had told Abraham, you and Sarah will have a set. And they were trying to help God out. You know, you <laughs> promised the son, I'm not getting pregnant. Take my, my slave. She'll have the son, but he'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll claim him as mine. That was, we looked at it, that was, it wasn't the laws of Hammurabi, but those laws pre existed Hammurabi's time, but there were laws that were in existence. It was a way that was accepted that they lived <clears throat> in at that time. Was it more to help the wife so she doesn't have to keep having these babies or? Maybe okay. so. <clears throat> Maybe so. You know, um, God's mercy to to them that there were, but you know, problems came with it too. Um, we're going to get into one situation coming up, and I'm already studying ahead of you. And the comment was made: they probably had their own tents where they raised their own children. Because can you imagine? You know, we know Sarah and Hagar couldn't get along. I can't imagine too many women who would get along with that many children in a small space without, that's my child, don't pick on my child, <laughs> you know, this sort of attitude. So there were problems that came with it too. I don't see it as God's ordained way because we see he gave one wife to Adam, but God did not seem to um, look at it as we do today. Oh, that's, you know, polygamy and that's terrible because we even see David had many wives and God said, when he pulled his set, God said, if you needed another wife, if you would have asked me, I would have given you another wife. So God's view doesn't seem to condemn it in the way we do it in our culture today. But we also don't see God set down that precedence. He did make Adam and Eve and, and Beth and, and, you know, I'm trying to think of names of people I don't know. <laughs> Sheila and, and Susie. And I'm trying to use names that aren't here, but you get the idea. And we see in the new covenant, we see, you know, to be the husband of one wife, and we see, you know, order that seems to be given. But again, God allowed it. God allowed Leah to be brought into Jacob, knowing that Rachel was the promise one through whom it was Jacob and Rachel's offspring that was going to carry on the seed. So, you know, God, he sees what we don't see and understands what we don't understand. I don't want to give the right to say, oh, well, then it's all cultural. No, I'm not saying that. Culture changes. God doesn't. God sits down, but he, you know, his rule and his way, and it, that doesn't change. But we don't see a condemnation like our culture condemns it today. There's a cult that believes in polygamy. That's all I need to say. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Okay. It's the cult who's believing that. They probably draw on those scriptures. I don't know because I've not been there with them. But again, it, you, I could also then draw on the scriptures where it says to be a husband of one wife. And I could give my example of Adam as I already have. So um, that's a little bit of a mystery explained to us when we get home. Didn't uh, Leah have Judah? Wasn't that her son? Um, yes, yes. Yes, so when I said what I did, I misspoke, didn't I? Because it's through Judah that it goes on. Yeah, but Rachel and Jacob had Joseph, 
and it was through Joseph that the line continued. Oh, you know, because they would have, if Joseph wasn't in Egypt, he rescued the race when they were almost to down to extinction. But you are right, it's through Judah that uh, that's the line, the royal line down as it continues. So, <laughs> yeah. I gotta watch every word that comes out of my mouth. You, you'll hear me pray that I speak truth because I am not perfect, that I try to handle the scripture with great reverence, respect, great time and study and in prayer, that I teach it as right as possible. And I ask God, let you hear it right, even if I speak it wrong. So you heard it right. Okay, but isn't Judah and Joseph brothers? Yes. So uh, yes. they always says it comes from the line of Judah. Because um, that's the so tribal line. It went through that, but they are brothers. You know, the same way that I can claim my brother or my sister's kids have my blood in them because we're all in that same family together. But did I literally give birth to them? No. Okay. Yeah, same way. Uh, it's in the family. A very close family. All the it's all the family. It's in the tribes. When when Pastor Gill was first finding out his Jewish roots and was working with a uh, secular Jewish rabbi at <laughs> anyway, she said, "Welcome to the tribe." <laughs> so, <laughs> and just our way of, of of phrasing it. So, okay. Any other questions? Have I told you everything I want to tell you before we go on? I think I have. I think I have. Are we good? We've got something going over there that I think it's not for me, so I won't worry about it. Just a quirk. Oh, and that's not me. Oh, yeah, I feel very quirky today. <laughs> okay, you can tell me later if you want. Chapter 23, sad chapter. Good chapter at the same time, but it's a sad note because we start right off with now Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And if you don't understand what that means, verse 2 makes it very clear Sarah died. Sarah died. Okay, so if she's 127, how old was she when Yitzhak was born? 90. Very good. A plus over there. She was 90. So how old is Yitzhak? 37. 37. Okay, I say this because I want us to keep thinking, you know, with the years. I, I'm amazed when I stop and think that he gave birth when he was 60. Uh, it, it blows my mind when I know Jacob goes to meet Rachel in his 70s. You know, we're not talking 20 year olds. When Jacob and Esau had their explosion, they're in their 70s. They're not little kids. <laughs> Yitzhak wasn't a little kid when he was up on that mountain being sacrificed. We talked about that. He was around 30. So here we know now he's definitely 37 because Sarah was 127. And it is interesting. She's the only woman in scripture whose age at the time of death is given. Oh, wow. You know how women don't like to tell their age? <laughs> is that because I don't know? But is it given her years because she was the important, shall I say, mother of the chosen people? Because it comes through. Was that why we're given more information? I don't know. But look how we are talked talked about, how she's talked about to us in scripture. Go with me to the prophet Isaiah. Anyone remember that in Isaiah, Yeshaya, Yeshahu, that Sarah is mentioned? Chapter 51. Chapter, Isaiah 51. Verses 1 and 2. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you are hewn. That's where were you formed? To the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave birth to you in pain. When he was but one, one person, I called him, then I blessed him, and I multiplied him. So in these two verses, who's held up? Abraham and Sarah, as an example to us. That here's one who, through her, this godly promise came down. Go with me to the new covenant. Remember that 
quilt Christian book that I introduced to you starts with the Jewish genealogy, why in my estimation, Mark or Luke or John, the other gospels were not put first because God wanted our Jewish people to see, keep reading, keep reading, go across that great divide. There's not a great divide. There's years, but that's all. It's a continuation. Keep coming. Now go all the way to first keep Peter, first keep it. Chapter three, first Peter three, and we'll read again about Sarah, a good Jewish name in a good Jewish book by another Jewish boy in the Jewish New Covenant. Sorry, if I'm on my uh, sandbox, forgive me. I'm on my sandbox because I cringe every time I hear someone say the Jewish side and the Christian side. No, no, it's the Jewish Christian side. Period. It's one continuous. Chapter three, verse three says, and I gotta see where it starts. Sorry, your your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Keep it. Peter's telling how to live godly. It's not the outside. Don't worry about the adornment of the outside. It's what's precious to God is the heart. It's what it's on the inside. For in this way, in former times, the holy women, the women that that he's holding up for an example, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves. How did they do it? By being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you become her children if you do what's right without being frightened by any fear. If you follow the godly example, if you are walking in the spirit, remember Sarah represented the spiritual where Hagar represented the fleshly. If you're walking according to the spirit, you're going to exemplify Sarah, the picture of the godly woman who in obedience to her husband, submitted to him. And that does not mean obedience that she was a doormat, that she went with him, journeyed with him, lived with him. They had their issues, but she stayed by his side, stayed faithful to him. And in that, she's the one who carried the promised child. She and uh, Abraham received that blessing. And in that same way, we're being told, stay obedient, be submissive, stay in the line that God has put you in, show your heart by your character not by what you dress up with on the outside i can try to dress up somebody else can dress up nicer but god alone can see my heart and that's all that matters yeah. not the outside man looketh on the, the outward appearance that god looks on, on the heart. heart and he gives the example of a godly heart by naming sarah so she's to be respected and she is in our jewish world she's highly held up and looked up to and if you hear a child given that name you know they're they're thinking in their minds they want their child to have a godly heart like sarah i love that too because we know she made a mistake that god doesn't dwell on the mistake and doesn't look at one moment in the life he looks at the whole the same with us we can make mistakes god forgives us hallelujah i would not make it through a day without that being true and I can't get back in my tablet. There we go. So Sarah is um, a godly woman to be respected. We're given her age for whatever reason. She died in Kiryat Arba. Now it says in parentheses that is Hebron, or you say Hebron. Okay. Kiryat Arba means the city of Arba. Kiryat city Arba was the name of the progenitor of the Anakim. The Anakim are the ones who were the giants at one point in time, we'll see that. They also were driven out by Caleb, by Caleb. They were in the land when Joshua and Caleb came in to possess the land. They were one of the ones that God was casting out. So in essence, they were an enemy of Israel in time as we go down the timeline. But uh, they came from Anakim, I'm sorry, they came from Arba, that Arba's generations down are the ones called the Anakim that come against Joshua, that can, uh, that were giants. Let's look at the scriptures. Maybe that will help you understand. But here's where they got their start 
is from this one by the name of Arba. Go with me to Joshua, Yeshua, Joshua, chapter 14 and verse 15. Joshua 14 and verse 15. Okay, now the name of Hebron, Hebron, exact what we just read in chapter 23, was formerly Kiryat Arba, for Arba was the greatest man among the Amakim. Then the land had rest from war. So this is, if I back up, you see Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron, Hebron to Caleb, Caleb um, for his inheritance. This is when they had, they battled and they were coming into the land of Israel and it was now being divided among those in the tribes. And Caleb and Joshua both were promised land because they were the two faithful witnesses. And Caleb stepped, stepped to the plate when he wasn't getting it and said, hey, where's my inheritance? It was promised to me. And Joshua says, yeah, you're right. And here's the land I'll give you. And the land he gives them is this area. It's called Hebron to this day, Hebron. And it used to be called Kiryat Arba, the city of Arba, because Arba was the man who was the head of what we call the Anarchy. It, it, it's, it's just the name that that family name carried, Arba was the head of the Anakim. I don't know how else to say it. Am I understanding? Okay, okay. Um, look at chapter 15, verse 13, since we're right there. 15 and verse 13. Genesis? No, 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 sorry, in Joshua. Oh. Let's flip over the next page, since we're right 15, there. 15, 14, it's 14, 15, no, 15, 14. Actually, 15, 13. 13, okay. <laughs> You're close. <laughs> now, he gave to Caleb, to Caleb, the son of Yafuna, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord to Yeshua, long way of saying, this is who it's coming to, namely, what did he give to Kala? Kiryat Arba, Arba being the father of Anak, that is Hebron. So these are all notes to help them understand. Hey, this area that you're calling Hebron today, this is what was called Kiryat Arba. It was called that because it was the city of Arba. And they said, well, who's Arba? Oh, well, he was the father of the Anakim. Okay, so it's just a way of helping you understand the history. And I want you to see that this note here again shows you how Moses made notations that help them understand because this didn't happen all the way back in chapter 23 in Genesis. It happens as time moves on. But because it moves on, Moshe wants them to understand what's being written. So it would be like if I use the ancient name today and I said, this took place in Kiryat Arba. Most of you, unless you've been to Israel and have had some education of geography in Israel, you would look at me like, where on earth do I find Kiryat Arba? And if I said, oh, it's in Israel, you'd say, okay, I know where Israel is. But then if I said to you, it's Look on your map and look for the word Hebron because that's how you pronounce it and how you see it. You can look. Oh, here's Hebron. Yes. Now his old name was Kiryat Arba. In today's time, maybe some of you are far far back enough to remember when Tel Aviv wasn't called Tel Aviv. It was called Luz, and the airport was first called the Luz Airport because that was the original name. Sorry, Luz. Lud, I'm saying it wrong. Luz is light in Hebrew. Lud. Um, but nobody knows it as Lud today except those who know Israel's history. Otherwise, they know it as Tel Aviv. I can't think of any example here. It's San Bernardino has always been called San Bernardino, as far as I know. <laughs> but I think you can understand. Sometimes a place will get a name change. And obviously, this place was named by this man who had great power, Arba. And it was called his city. And he was the father of these people that became known as the Anakim. So it took on that connotation. And then because we know it today as Hebron, and by Moses' day, it was known as Hebron. He brought that into the picture also. Where did they start from? What, what city did they come from? What they, city? Abraham? Uh -huh. Abraham from Mesopotamia, Ur of the Chaldees. He came from the area near Tigris and Euphrates. Oh, okay. And remember, he journeyed a long way, came through 
probably Iraq, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Iran, Syria, down into uh, Israel, came down from the north, and finally all the way, way down south in Beersheba. Well, the reason I'm asking was I thought where they come from sounds familiar with this parable. Not where they come from. I'm trying to think what city we may have referred to earlier. Um, okay, I'm just all mixed up. <laughs> Sorry, not, not hard to do. Hebron <laughs> and Beersheba are close on the map. Oh. If that helps you put it where it belongs. There is the river uh, Abar that's a little close to Hebron, Hebron. I'm not sure why I confused you and made you think that. Okay. But this 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 was one of the enemies in the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan oh. is what you would call Israel today, only it was far bigger than what we call Israel today. And remember, there were seven nations that God said are in that land, that their sin is so great. I'm going to cast them out. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to put my name on it. It's going to be yours forever. Okay. The Anakim were one of the first um, enemies that were talked about right here. That was going to be one of the enemies cast out when they came in. And that happened in Joshua's day. Joshua's day. Okay, we're getting a lot of history, geography, everything thrown at us, and uh, it's, it's a lot to absorb. You can go on and read about the Anakim in Joshua chapter 21, also verses 11 and 12. Let me show you, they were also giants. Go with me to the book called Numbers. In my Hebrew, that's called Ben and Bar, that will make it easy for you and tell you that's Numbers. And uh, if you're following the portions of scripture that are read, uh, you want numbers 13, uh, numbers. that are read in, by the, those following in Judaism every week, we were in, near this area, we're in, in numbers right now. Numbers 13, verse 22. When they had gone up into the Negev, the Negev is the southern desert, Beersheba and Hebron are in the Negev. They came to Hebron, Hebron, where, and it gives these names now, uh, Haman, Shashai, Gamai, Talmai, I don't know. Anyway, the descendants of Anak were. And then it tells you, here's another name change. Hebron was built seven years before, oh no, it's not a name change, before Zoar, Zoan in Egypt. So it gave another note. They knew the city of Zoan, Zoan and it was saying, well, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan. It would be just like if you came into San Bernardino and, and you saw um, Highland, because Highland's really taken on an individual identity by now. And I would say to you, yeah, but San Bernardino was here long before Highland. Highland is now grown out of San Bernardino. It's just a note like that. But notice how it says that, that this was the descendants of Anak, the same one that we're talking about, Anak the Anakim. Their father, their progenitor is Arba. That you can see easily, Anak, Anakim, the people of Anak were called Anakim by this point. That same line. I did you verse 22, look at verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Okay, the same people we're talking about, they saw them there in the land. And verses 32 and 33 says, so they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we've gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people whom we've seen are men of great size. They were they also were with that. There also we saw the Nephilim. The sons of Ammon are part of the Nephilim. And we are become grasshoppers in our own sight, and we were in their sight. These that they're calling the Nephilim were giants, were tall. Goliath was of the Nephilim, okay? They were they were tall people. Um, there's controversy in what I just said. I don't want to get off into that, but just get the point here. We've got the Anakim in the land. They were the ones that were giants. Now, remember our 12 spies went in, and this is what we're studying in our parashahs right now, or very recently. The 12 spies went in to spy out the land. They're there. They're um, the children of Israel are on the border of the promised land. They're ready to go in. They know that there are enemies in there. The spies are sent in. Go check it out. See what you can find out. Come back and give us a report. Ten of them came back and said, 
They're huge. They're giants. We're like little grasshoppers. We don't even come up to their knees. We can't fight against them. And they scared the people off. And in unbelief, those people, because they didn't walk in their faith, God didn't let them go into the promised land. They lost out on the blessing. It's the next generation that comes up that Yahshua and Caleb, two fit, uh, the two faithful witnesses, said, wait, they'll be bread for us. We can eat them up. We can get rid of them because we're in the power of our God. So God honored them. Their faith was there. He honored them. They got to go in and possess the land. But here's our history. Here's what we're talking about. So if you want to read about the Anakim being driven out, Caleb is the one possessing the land, Caleb. Um, he drives them out. You can read in Joshua chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. We were close there. We started it, but I don't think we read verse 14, even though and prophetically tried to get us to. <laughs> and you can also read it summarized in Joshua chapter 11, verses 21 and 22. So this is the same Hebron. This is the same area. The people that were here, we know who these people are now. We take all that back with us into Genesis. And basically that's what Moshe did. When he was writing it down, he was saying, here's what we know about this area today. This area that, that's called, when Sarah died, Kiryat Arba, it's now called Hebron. As soon as they hear that, they know, oh, that's the land where the Anakim were. That's the area, I should say, where the Anakim were. So it's his editorial note. Let me see. I forget what it says, but I think it might help us. It's Genesis 35 and verse 27. Uh, it's either another example or better. Let me just look real quick. Sorry, I don't remember. Um, 35 and verse 27 of Genesis. Oh, okay. It's just reinforcing. Yaakov, Jacob came to his father, Yitzhak, Isaac, at memory of Kiryat Arba, in parentheses, that is Hebron, Hebron, and, and where Abraham and Yitzhak had sojourned. So again, it's just showing you, Moses is making that note. He's telling you, Abraham and Isaac were here. Later, we're going to see Jacob's there. Later, it becomes, by the time it's being written, it's, it's become called Hebron. So we're all on the same page. We're all in the same area. Um, remember, Abraham had gone to Beersheba right after offering up Yitzhak because we said he went from the mountain of promise the, the, to the oath, from the mountain sacrifice to the oath. Okay, so they moved back from Beersheba apparently sometime after Isaac and Abraham went through this at Moriah. Let me take you back to chapter 21 so I make it clear and we'll stop off in 23. Oh my word, I see the time. I'll tie up my note here. Sorry, folks, I lost track of time. Are we back in Genesis? So we're back in Genesis. In Genesis 21, back the Isaac's born, we have Hagar, we have all of that. In verse 31, no, 33, Genesis 21, verse 33, we have finally where Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and he called on the name of the Lord there. Um, in fact, let me just read it to the end. The everlasting God and Abraham resided in the land of the Philistines for many days. Abraham lived in Beersheba in that area in this time, okay? Beersheba is very close to Hebron, remember that. Now, go to chapter 22, because I just read you from 21. Abraham's living in Beersheba. In chapter 22, we have the sacrifice or the near sacrifice of Yitzhak. In verse 19, we have that Abraham returned. They went up together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived in Beersheba. So in 22, we've got them living there also. Now we're going to see that um, there's going to be a change that will come. But let me not confuse you for today. Let me take you back into to chapter 23 and just tell you he's living in this area of Beersheba where we've been told. And yet when Sarah dies, she dies in Hebron, very close to Beersheba. Remember, Abraham didn't buy property and set up a house or a palace. He was a sojourner. He moved around. He settles in this area for the most part now. 
this is where his wife dies, but we're going to see he's also another area too. So I'm going to leave you on the sad note that it came, um, well, and it tells you it's in the land of Canaan. I can finish this verse. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Okay, so next week we'll talk about the custom of mourning, what that really means. And why does it say he mourned for her and weeped for her? Why do we have the two different words for, from our text? Um, very related, but I'll just explain why it says that. And what happens because his beloved wife is now passed away. If you're not familiar with the chapter, what do you do when someone's passed away? You bury them. Okay, Abraham doesn't have a place that's his own. What's he going to do? He's got a problem. If we get a whole chapter that tells what he does. I was going to say, he hasn't bought that cave nope. yet. Nope. That's chapter 23. Oh. Is it, but that's not where Sarah's buried, is she? She is? I thought just Leah was buried. Nope. Abraham and Isaac. Um, sorry, Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> Isaac and <laughs> Rebecca. Jacob and Leah. Rachel is the one not in this tomb. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yes, if you're familiar with the cave of Machpelah, We'll talk about that next week. I'll get a picture up for us. Uh, I have been there. So I, I've all seen, <laughs> but they let you see. Um, but it's, it's, it's a sad chapter, but there's a lot that we'll learn out of it. A lot that, you know, helps explain other things. So it'll be an interesting chapter at the same time. But um, maybe we're getting a little prepared to say goodbye to Opera Home. <laughs> always have trouble when we get to stay with them for a while I don't want to let go <laughs> and we really don't have to and then I think my brother David and my adopted sister Anne they've met them they've talked with them <laughs> they got answers to our questions <laughs> and I say feed me up Lord <laughs> I want to go too they cut in line they took cuts in line Yes, <laughs> yeah, but it blows my mind because David and I talked some about Abraham and I can just, I know he wanted to see what Abraham really looked like. And there was a reason from a story that we heard, I don't take time now, I'm way past, but I know, I know at one point he had to be lined over there, gotta, gotta see Abraham face to face. <laughs> and I'm happy for that. And one day we will all reach. So let's close in prayer and then I'll open the mics. Lord God, thank you. Please take what was maybe confusing today and straighten it in our minds. Let us have the clarity. Let us absorb what we need to do to know and to understand that we clearly see obedience to you is critically important and that it does come with great blessing. And we thank you for that. We thank you for keeping your word, faithfully keeping your word. We thank you that you were willing to completely sacrifice yourself. And that you are that promised seed. Whether we are we were looking forward or looking back, you are the savior of the world. And we praise you for ever for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the promise of home with you forever. Those who've gone ahead and those of us still coming, but thank you. We know it for a fact. And we just say hallelujah. Anxious, but let us take a few more home with us, Lord, in your precious name. Our precious Savior, our Redeemer, the rock of our salvation, Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, questions, comments? Am I sending you out with mud? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I've got one saying yes. <laughs> I'll give you a whole week to absorb it and come back with any questions, okay? I see, I'm trying to do where it'll show. Where does it show? I'm giving you my heart. <laughs> <laughs>